many of you in the room have any children? Just a special advance. A few of you. How many children do you have, Richard? Two. Francis? Four. Emma? I think. Two. Any other hands in this one? David? Two. Anybody top four? <laughs> what is that, the top number? <laughs> That's one of those questions, isn't it, that comes up when we're out and about connecting with people, particularly perhaps when we meet them for the first time, networking. And I'd like to share my children with you. That's a picture of my two and me, surprisingly enough, from back in 2003. And up on my shoulder there is Matthew. He was six years old at the time. And snuggled under here is Liam, and he was eight. And we went for one of those, you know, those photo sessions that you go to studios and you hang out romping about and having loads of fun. I don't know if you've done that. Yeah. And then you spend an arm and a leg on buying photos because you've got enough all of them when you go We had an amazing time that day. Lots of fun to the good degree that Liam, at eight years old, said, Can we do this again sometime? Which is not really what you normally get from an eight year old, I would suggest, to learn photography. And for me, this session, in a way, was marking a new phase in our lives together. I absolutely loved being a mum, I was running my own business, so I loved all that to and fro to school, the little woods that we could walk through, or sometimes the kids at the local high school would laugh as they saw me scooting by on the scooter with another one over my shoulder because the boys loved it. If I would bring scooters down to school, I don't know why it was funny. If I'd been on a bike, nobody would have batted an eyelid, would they? But somehow, me on a scooter, it was funny. But I loved all of that fun. And the reason this was a new phase in our lives was the one thing I was really sad about was that Will's dad, Steve, and I had separated a year earlier we got divorced. And I was sad that my children were, were from a broken family. But we did everything we could to make that as smooth a transition as possible. The boys saw, saw lots of Steve, plenty of time with me, and it was time for us to adapt to a new way of living. And I guess that's what we did. We became Jane and the boys. All these things. Where are the boys? What should we do? Where are we going with the boys? Oh, we had lots of fun. Holidays. We had an amazing holiday in Italy. They both done done the Romans by that stage. What can we make? Doing the Romans. <laughs> so trips to the Colosseum and other landmarks were really special because it, for them it was bringing to life the stuff that they've been learning about from books and internet. And it was just a special time for all of us. We were camping, we went skiing, holidays with friends. Life really was, I would say, quite an adventure and lots of fun. And then all of that changed. On June the 20th, 2007, I have to say the hardest words of my life. I was standing in the entrance of a Sikh temple where Liam was on a school trip as it happened that day. And I remember as he walked through the door to come towards me, he must have seen from my face. There was something wrong, because I'll never forget the look of, I think it was fear or shock, perhaps to see me there, that was on his face as he walked towards me. I got down on my knees and I put my arms around him. And I said, I've got some terrible news. Matthew died this morning. It's all that day in that moment, that question, do you have a family? How many children do you have? changed completely for me. I have loved having those conversations. 
And suddenly, I didn't even know I had to have them anymore. How do you get through something like that? It's like you're in a swamp. Not just in your worries in a swamp. Up to here in the swamp. And the thing <coughs> that was the first chink of light for me was the love and support that came from all the people in our community. I've never known anything like it. People would show up with cards and flowers, food to make sure that as a family we carried on eating. It was like an enormous wave of love. And I remember saying to my mum, it. It was like a soft air-filled cushion that helped to cushion the landing. Completely blew me away. And that helped to take the first step into that new world where really what happens every single day when you have something like that land in your world. From the moment you wake up, at the moment when you eventually fall asleep, there's no room in your head for anything else. But gradually, gradually somehow you start to connect with the people around you and that love, that wave of love really did provide a huge support. What about that question? Okay, everybody in our community knew I was about somebody who lost his son. When I started getting out there again, it wasn't known, there's no sign over your head saying what your story is. And it was such a tricky one to answer. I remember saying to a friend, I feel really sorry for the person when I tell them I used to have two children and now I only have one. So I'd be weighing up in the moment. Will I see you again? Do I say it out loud? Do I bring this conversation to a place where people respond in lots of different ways? Some people wanted to reach out, some people gave me a hug. Others were, there was like a look of fear in their eyes. I'm like, God, why do I go with this conversation now? We need to have those conversations. I believe we need to say it out loud. But I struggled with that for the best part of the last seven years. Do I or don't I? Interestingly, another friend also said to me, and it was really, really well intentioned, what I don't want for you is that this defines you. And I really took that in. And I thought, yeah, I don't want it to define me either. So that was part of this, do I or don't I say it? But actually, when I wasn't saying it, I was sort of defining myself in a different way. Because a piece of me was missing from that conversation. An enormous piece, actually. Whilst I am not defined by the fact that I lost my son, it has had a huge impact on me. It is a part of who I am. Mm. When I leave that out, I'm not completely present. So I took a decision last autumn that I was going to stop doing that. I'm not doing that anymore. If somebody asks about my family and my children, I tell the truth. And if it's a bit tricky for a moment or two, so be it. How will we ever learn to have conversations about difficult subjects if we never have them? It's just perpetuating something. And the impact it had for me was enormous because I felt whole. What I thought I was doing in protecting the other person from this bit of conversation, I thought it was helpful, and actually it wasn't serving them and it wasn't serving me. 
I thought what I was doing, what I, I knew all along I didn't feel good about it. And I thought it was because I wasn't honoring Matthew's memory. But it isn't that. I wasn't honoring who I am. So when I made that decision last autumn, I'm going to tell the truth when I'm asked that question. I stepped into the hole with me. And it is such a better place to be. Such a better place to be. And as a result of that, I will talk freely about it when the subject matter arises. It so happens that last autumn I was asked whether I would speak at a business group. And I said yes, because I enjoy sharing ideas. And the topic that I chose was purpose. What's your purpose? Are you connected with your purpose? And I chose to speak about a business example, and I also spoke about losing Matthew and the purpose that that has brought into my life. Because there was a question that David asked me, I think towards the end of October. What's your miracle? Out popped. I want to ensure there is a medical device that enables GPs to quickly and easily diagnose when there's something wrong with a child's appendix. Because that's what happened to Matthew. It's really hard to diagnose when there's something wrong with a child's appendix in particular. <coughs> it shows up with you know, tummy ache, sickness. It is not always clear cut. And the longer the time lapse between a perforated appendix and actually discovering that and dealing with it, the higher the chance of complications, as you can imagine. Why was it a surprise when that popped out of my mouth? Well, what I don't want you to know about me is I'd heard about the possibility of that thing being developed in 2011. And the person I heard it from is somebody I know as a parent at the local cricket club. So Liam plays cricket, his son plays cricket. We're chatting, he knew what had happened to Matthew. And he said, oh, I'm working with somebody on this project. We think we can devise something. We need to get some funding and take it forward. And I was like, oh, that's fantastic. If you need any help with fundraising, give me a shout, keep me informed. But actually at that stage, I was in a, when I was, to a degree back in the swamp, I wasn't totally on top form. A few different things going on. I was recognising the fact that my nest would be emptying in a couple of years' time, and I felt robbed. Because really, it should have been four years' time, not two years' time, when I'd be facing that nest. And I hated it. So I went, at the time, into a, a dark place again. <coughs> So when Jim told me about this project, I was like, yeah, okay, let's go for it. Keep, keep me informed, but I didn't do anything else. So then David asked me that question, what's your miracle? And blah, out it came, I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't crossed paths with Jim. I thought, okay, I've got to do this. I've got to do something about it. So I reached out to Jim and we had a conversation about the fact that, yes, they'd come up with this research plan, but it had stalled because it was based on a piece of research that was from the US and it wasn't considered robust enough. Okay. <coughs> so when I'm talking to this group of business owners about purpose, what I shared with them was, when you connect with your purpose from here, when I connect with my purpose from here, there is nothing that's going to stop me making sure it happens. We can have all sorts of reasons in here, can't we, about why we want something to happen, what we want to get done. But when you really, really feel it in here, nothing will get in the way. And I think when he asked me that question, my heart just opened and I went, Ugh. I even said, oh, it can't be that. Yeah. I, I, I can't be that. Oh. Well, it is. 
So the business group, I shared the story that I've just shared with you. And almost as soon as I finished speaking, there was a lady sitting here who stood up immediately and said, I can help. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you can help? Mm -hmm. She works as a consultant into NHS England in the innovations area. She understands the routes to getting NP new products developed, how to get the funding, what the different methods of achieving that might be. She's like, I'll do, I'll do whatever I can to help you. Wow. So by saying my truth out loud, Rachel showed up. And we now have this little project team. So there's Rachel, and there's me, and there's Jim, who's a professor at Leeds Uni, and a clinician. He had mentioned to me there's a clinician who's really interested in this. And we met up two weeks ago. And that was absolutely amazing. I know we're going to make this happen. Because that clinician that he'd referred to as Johnson, I didn't know who he was. He was the chap who came on duty in the period of time when Mackie had collapsed and they were trying to sort out what was wrong with him. He must have been within that yard. So I saw in his heart. He talked to me about Matthew. With love. And I know he will do everything he can to make this project happen. Isn't it amazing what shows up when you're willing to say out loud, this is who I am, this is what's happened. So for me, that project is about bringing something positive. I will never be okay that Matthew died. It will never be okay. But if I can do something that saves anybody else from what we as a family have to go through, I'm going to do it. We will make that project happen. There'll be some hurdles. So what? There's a project plan that it might take 40 months, it might take longer. I don't care. I have permission from Jim to chibi and be on his case and how's it going and to do whatever it takes. Do you think I'm not going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing on earth will stop me. And that's what happens. That's what's happened for me, just from saying out loud, this is what I am. Thank you.